Hello, it's Scott Manley here. By now, you might have heard that Arecibo Observatory had an incident on Monday night which has led to damage to the telescope and they've had to bring it offline. Now, Arecibo Observatory is probably one of the most famous telescopes in the world. It's probably the most famous radio telescope. And that's partly because for 50 years, it was the largest radio telescope in the world. It's only recently been superseded by a Chinese telescope, but this also led to it turning up in uh, you know, movies, in, in contact. Uh, it turned up in GoldenEye. And kind of like GoldenEye, the incident was a cable snapped. Now, let me explain how what Arecibo looks like for those that people don't know. Arecibo is a 300 meter wide, 1000 feet wide um, dish, radio dish, and it reflects up to a focal point. And at the focal point, there's a big structure that can move the sensors and antenna around. And that itself is suspended on cables that are attached to three towers. Now, you might think having a broken cable would lead to that structure falling down and destroying the dish. Thankfully, engineers are smart and they have redundant cables. But yes, the cables are all very big and very strong. To support the 900 ton mass with cables that are 150 meters long, they have cables that are like three inch thick braided steel or like eight centimeters. These are very, very thick woven together bundles of steel. And that means they're heavy. I think every meter of cable has a mass of 20 to 25 kilograms. So when you've got hundreds of meters of this stuff and it falls down and it hits that dish down below, it tore a gash in the dish 30 plus meters long, which is not good. But also, it also had enough um, energy. It smashed into the side of one of the instruments or one of the housings for the instruments. It's called the the Gregorian dome because it contains a pair of smaller dishes in the style of a Gregorian telescope. And that has sustained some damage and apparently the damage has resulted in the catwalk that people would use to access it being knocked out so they can't even get in right now safely. Uh, there are some photographs and it looks a lot better when you're looking at it from above than when you're standing underneath it and you just see this huge chunk open to the sky. Uh, interesting thing about this is because it's a radio telescope, it only needs to reflect radio waves. And there's a lot of holes uh, in, it's basically a mesh that reflects back. And so that means there's plenty of vegetation that lives underneath the dish. So yeah, the photos, I, I looked at one that showed where the cable had broken. And it looks to me like the cable has actually pulled out of the socket. Now, I think these are called pelter sockets. And the way they work is they're like a conical shape like this with a hole in the bottom. The cable goes up on the inside. Then what they do is the cable is made of a lot of smaller cables. So they basically unwind the, wind the cable, splay it all out into a mess of wires like that inside this cone. And then they pour in liquid metal and it sets around these cables, these tiny little wires, and that is held inside this larger socket and that holds it on. That's a very, very strong socket and it needs to be because you're trying to hold thousands of tons of tension on this thing. But it's it's come out and I'm not sure what has, why that would fail. Like, is there some sort of deferred maintenance that we are gonna see that we need to deal with? It is a very old installation, but it has been upgraded consistently over its lifespan. Uh, and, and yeah, you know, it, as I said, it's very old. It was built originally, curiously enough, there's a story about how its building was actually something of a mistake. The scientist who originally had the idea to build a telescope in the landscape wanted to look at the ionosphere, right? This sort of plasma layer just above the Earth's atmosphere. And he thought that he could zap it with radio waves and then listen for the uh, echoes coming back. And he did some back of the envelope mathematics and he said, okay, we're gonna need a radar dish a thousand feet across. And the only way to do that is to put it in the landscape. And you know they set around starting to build that and after consultation with some other people, they modified the design. Originally it was gonna have a tower in the middle. Originally it was gonna be a parabolic shape. They changed it to a, a spherical shape, which meant that they could actually move the sensors around and get, you know, focal, they could get a focal spot anywhere and therefore steer the dish. 
Turns out before it was even finished building, somebody else tried this ionospheric uh, observation with radar with a smaller antenna and it worked just fine. So the guy's math may have been uh, a little pessimistic, but nevertheless, we got this very large radio telescope out of it. And one of the very first things that it did was it did radar observations of Mercury. So it wasn't just a passive listener. This thing can send out pulses and it can send them out across the solar system. And they were able to observe Mercury and observe the rotation of Mercury. And they showed that while astronomy had thought that Mercury rotated in a one-to-one -one resonance, keeping one side facing the Sun, it actually rotated in a three-to-two resonance, rotating three times for every two orbits. And that changed astronomy. So it did a lot of other work. It looked at pulsars and, uh, of course, studied those, studied their ticks. And one of the most famous pieces of art comes from Arecibo observations of a pulsar, where uh, the scientist took a number of pulses and he laid out their time data on top of each other and created this sort of ridgeline plot, also known as a joy plot, because it was used for the cover to Joy Division's Unknown Pleasures. And you might not have heard of that album, but you have almost certainly seen the design on the cover of that album because it's everywhere. It's arguably more famous than the research, or more famous than the album and more famous than the research for sure. Um, yeah, so this was all done, I believe it was Cornell University originally funded this. There was some work with the Department of Defense. Uh, apparently, I, I've read that they were able to use it to observe radio signals reflected off the moon and determine the location of certain facilities in Russia by carefully timing the responses. Not really clear about that exactly, but it does sound consistent with the kind of stuff that they do. There's also cases where they've been able to listen to like shortwave radio bouncing off the moon and things like that. So, um, it was, it's been upgraded over time. In the 1970s, they wanted it to, they wanted to improve its frequency response. They'd used a very coarse mesh early on, like a wire mesh, but they decided that they wanted to work at higher frequencies and that meant the dish surface had to be more perfectly flat. So they switched to these flat aluminium panels with holes in it and that now keeps the shape of the surface to within about one millimeter of accuracy. That, and that improved their frequency response to higher frequencies. Um, in the 1990s, they upgraded again. They added like this fence around the top and that's not to keep people out. What that does is it stops black body radiation from the landscape. And because the landscape is warm, it's emitting infrared, but it's also emitting radio waves and microwaves. And so they want to block that out to make sure that it doesn't interfere with the signals. In the 1990s, that was when they added the Gregorian system. So that's this, uh, as I said, it looks it looks a bit like a golf ball, I guess. But what happens is the, um, the radio waves get focused up inside this, and then there's a secondary mirror and an, a tertiary mirror, and these aren't spherical. These are carefully designed to remove the spherical aberrations and produce a perfect focal point. So this is what's used for most of the observations these days. Uh, the focal point is like an instrument carousel, so they can switch out which instrument they're using. And of course, they've done a lot of good work with that. The whole thing can steer around. You'll notice that it's on this sort of circular, semicircular track. It's not semicircular, it's sort of circular, I'll say. Uh, there's two instruments, and when they move towards the middle, they move together to keep everything balanced. And when they move out, they, they move out together. The whole track can rotate around and that allows them to cover something like plus or minus 20 degrees in both longitude or, or right ascension and declination, which uh, is great, <laughs> I guess. It lets them steer, it lets them focus on specific things. Uh, what? Oh yeah, it was apparently they were able to discover the first binary pulsar with that. And the first binary pulsar let them provide the first evidence for gravitational waves. Because you had a binary pulsar, you've got two compact objects, and as they're orbiting each other, they're emitting a small amount of gravitational radiation. And that radiation meant it was taking energy away from the system, so it was spiraling down towards each other and getting slightly faster. And they were able to measure 
this change in the orbit and I believe that might have been Nobel Prize winning work for discovering the this providing this evidence of gravitational waves pretty amazing stuff and yeah Arecibo also discovered the first extrasolar planets again around a pulsar yeah Arecibo loves its pulsars it also as a radar installation it's unparalleled it's been able to make observations of many many asteroids as they fly by um, you're basically sending out high energy radar pulses and getting structure back and making these great movies of objects that are too small to resolve using current telescopes apparently the one of the funny things I read is that there is a limit to how far out they can use the radar and the limit is about 10 AU the time it takes for the signal to get there and come back is longer than they can keep a target inside their plus or minus 20 degree cone so there's a limit the, to all this yeah um Arecibo Observatory as I said it's been around for 50 years it has been upgraded over time and they've certainly had refreshments and refurbishments but I, I am worried that it hasn't been getting quite the amount of love that it needs it it had its funding essentially cut down to zero in the early 2000s and then funding or this was NASA funding and then funding was restored in about 2010 now it's switched from Cornell to I believe the University of South Florida I I, I might be getting that one wrong but you know it's such an iconic place and I'm really sad to hear it get damaged like this I, I also get damaged during Hurricane Maria but they managed to get it operational again I hope in this case they're able to uh, bring it back online and, and make everything work because I think it's too good a scientific instrument for the world to lose I'm Scott Manley fly safe <laughs>